if you're not already uh, prepared and ready for that. So I'm going to stop the screen share now and uh, uh, come in and uh, show my face. <laughs> so uh, really, really great to, to, to be with you this morning and to uh, be able to see you. Um, or at least not be able to see you, I suppose, but you're in a position to see me. So a very, very warm welcome. We're going to worship uh, the Lord together. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. So uh, do get yourself all set and, and ready to go. Um, we're really looking forward to being able to worship God in this, uh, this way together. So hopefully you're sitting nice and comfortably and uh, got yourselves all, all set up and ready to go. So it's... Uh, a, a kind of special day in our calendar. Uh, it's the 21st of June. Uh, Anne has reminded us in the uh, live chat, it's the longest day. Um, doesn't quite look like the most glorious of mornings, but uh, praise God for rain and sun. We need it all. It's also Father's Day. And uh, in Proverbs 30, uh, sorry, Proverbs 23 and verse 22, it says, Listen to your father who gave you life. The Bible affirms fatherhood uh, and also uh, Jesus taught us that we could approach God as our father. That's how he taught us to pray. The, the heart of the Christian gospel really is that God brings a, 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 re a reconciliation, a family reconciliation between us as, as it were, straying sons and daughters, reconciled to our father in heaven. So we give thanks uh, this morning for our fathers uh, in, in all of their uh, humanity with their strengths and their weaknesses but as we give thanks to God for our fathers we also give thanks to God that he is our father in heaven that's how he's revealed uh, himself to us um, so just before we uh, get ready to start uh, our time of worship this morning um, I've discovered that we have a birthday and uh, this morning it's uh, Leslie Pearson's birthday so let's uh, let's sing happy birthday to Leslie together now happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday dear Leslie happy birthday to you Woo! thank God for you Leslie bless you well I'm going to hand over now uh to Toby, who's going to be uh, leading us in worship. So I'm just going to uh, get him uh, up and running. So hand over to you now. Yeah. All good, John? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Good morning, church. Um, it's lovely to broadcast to you all. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was praying this week and like hearing from God, I, um, I felt before worship that, that he told me there are three sort of types of people. Like you could... You could have had a really good relationship with God this week. You feel that everything's going well. You could um, you could feel that you've messed up. You could feel that you've maybe disappointed him in some way. Or you could feel that maybe you don't even have a relationship with God at all. Um, I just want to read to you a couple of um, Bible passages. So in John 6 verse 40, Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and who believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day and in 1 Peter 5 verse 6 to 7 it says humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you so whoever you are God has a heart for you God has a heart he wants to be your father and he wants to he wants to meet with you this morning so let's just fo yeah let's focus our attention on him this morning Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, nor be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy prayer. Do that verse again. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, nor be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day. I pray. 
presence thy light Be thou my wisdom Be thou my true word And I ever with thee And thou with me, Lord Thou my great Father We're going to sing, and can it be? i 
So um, Phil's just going to come into uh, the call and just share something and pray with us for a moment or two. So just, uh, Phil, do you want to switch your video on, please? Morning. <laughs> okay, the, the Lord showed me some, um, some gates and uh, beyond the gates there was this amazing um, barley field this beautiful barley field that was um, that is um, ready for harvest and uh, some of it was um, a bit green around the edges where it had been in shade from the from the sunshine but the majority of it was ripe and ready i looked at the gates and the gates had a heavy chain and a padlock with a sign saying private no access there was more than a field, there was a path, and the path was overgrown, a, a disused railway. I felt God show me that there was no way into the field, that the owner was refusing to let anyone into the field. I felt that God showed me that there is a lock on the harvest, that there's no access, access is denied by the owner. The field is revival. The owner is described in Romans 8 as the one that subjects our creation to frustra frustration or futility. Desperation and groaning are beyond the gates. Bondage and decay, but there's a longing. I sense that we're called to pray for an unlocking of these gates, a breaking of the chains that are denying access to revival. There was an old way that needs to be opened up. I got a strange feeling when I looked at the padlock, a sense of frustration, as if I had had this feeling before. I was trying to do things in my own strength. There was a sense of disappointment. I felt a sense of injustice when I looked at the sign on the path because the path was lush and exciting and I wanted to know where it went. It's been this way for years and years. I want to call on the frustration, a sense of injustice to drive prayer for release, new birth, a weeping 
before something amazing, a move of God, like Hannah weeping for Samuel. For the frustration to drive us into a place of surrender, into a position of prayer for the breaking of chains. For disappointment to become surrender, for the sense of injustice to declare God's promises over the way to be opened up. I'm just going to pray now. Heavenly Father, we call on you. And there's that sense in Romans 8 of that frustration of creation in eager expectation for the sons of glory to come into their own. Lord, we call on you. We call on you to open up the way, to break to break those chains, Lord, for that way to be opened up, for us to be able to move forward into a new season, Lord, a new season that is lush, that is full of harvest, a way forward, Lord Jesus, into a way, Lord, that may be a bit unknown to us, Lord, but you know the way. Lord, I pray that you will open up the way and break the chains, Lord, and open the gates in your name, Jesus. Amen. Man, we um, we do uh, pray for a uh, an openness in our own hearts, Lord, to whatever you want to be doing with us at this time, Lord. It's been such a, a surprising year. Uh, look, so many things, Lord, have happened that we could never have thought of or <laughs> forecasted. But Lord, this morning, in the midst of all of those questions, uncertainties, and pressures that we feel, Lord, we do want to turn our hearts uh, to you, Lord. We want to look to you, Lord. We we are longing for you to do such wonders in the nations and in our nation and in our communities. Lord, we pray now that you will do something in our own hearts this very morning as we seek your face now. Amen. I'm going to hand back to... uh, Let's sing, For You a Fire. For you a fire For you an everlasting flame For you a passion that burns Oh, a passion that burns For your everlasting name For you a fire Oh, a passion that burns for your everlasting name. Let it rise, let it rise, an everlasting flame, a fire for your name. Let it rise, let it rise, a holy offering. Burning from within, we shine bright and lift up your name. We lift your name high. Let all our hallelujahs be yours. Let all our hallelujahs be yours. From the altar of our hearts, O oh God. Flames of worship rise, let all our hallelujahs be yours, let all our hallelujahs be yours, from the altar of our hearts, O oh God, the flames of worship rise. Lift you high, lift you high, an everlasting flame, a fire for your name. We 
lift you high, lift you high, a holy offering that's burning from within. We shine bright and lift up your name, we lift your name high, let all our hallelujahs be yours, let all our hallelujahs be yours, and from the altar of our hearts, O oh God, the flames of worship rise, let all our hallelujahs Sing God so loved, Savior of the world. God so loved that he gave his son to lay down his life for the sake of us. He bore the weight of our sin and shame With a cry he said, it is finished Christ the Lord overcame the darkness He's alive, death has been defeated For he made us a way by which we have been saved he's the savior of the world so we lift up and shout for his fame and renown praise the lord praise the lord jesus savior of the world We must spread the word of his soon return To reclaim the world for his glory Let the church now sing of this coming King Crowned with majesty, our Redeemer And he reigns, the ruler of the heavens and his name is Jesus the Messiah For he made us a way by which we have been saved He's the Savior of the world So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Jesus, Savior of the world. And he reigns, the ruler of the heavens, and his name is Jesus the Messiah, for he made us away by which we have been saved. He's the Savior of the world. So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Jesus, Savior of the
Right. Um, Marie's just going to lead us in some prayer for a couple of minutes now. So I'm going to hand over to Marie now. So we, one of the things that we believe as followers of Jesus is that he heals the sick. When we look at his life, he went about healing the sick, casting out demons, and, and people's lives were transformed by his healing power and grace. And we um, believe that he's told us to go and heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse lepers, raise the dead, and make disciples. And so we're going to just spend some time now praying for the sick. Uh, we're going to be trusting that God is going to heal people today. We, we've seen some amazing healing testimonies in um, the church family over the recent years. We've seen bent spines straightened. We've seen epilepsy stop. We've seen all sorts of different things. And, and we're trusting God for more. We believe that he wants to heal more people. It's his heart and his nature and he loves to heal. So uh, I'm going to pray now for uh, you to be healed. If you need healing today in any part of your body, um, then I would encourage you as I'm praying for you, ask God to heal you in that area too. So um, I'm going to name some specific things as well as pray for the general things. Um, and it doesn't matter if I don't name your specific issue. Uh, God knows what your need is and he can heal through at these prayers so father i want to thank you that you love to heal i thank you that you are at work amongst us and that you are regularly healing people today that wasn't something for two thousand years ago this is something that we are seeing and hearing stories of day in and day out and we thank you for that knowledge and so father we ask right now will you come with your healing power and I speak to all sickness in the name of Jesus. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Spirit of infirmity, be gone in the name of Jesus. I speak to all muscles, tendons, ligaments, sinews, anything that's out of place that is causing bodies to be in pain. I speak to you now and I command you to go back in place to be realigned and to function well in the name of Jesus. I speak to all headaches and migraines in the name of Jesus, and I command you to stop and to be gone. All pain, go in the name of Jesus. Insomnia, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. I speak to all chronic fatigue and ME in the name of Jesus. And I speak to you now and I say, be gone in the name of Jesus. And we speak to all lung conditions, asthma, COPD, any unknown lung conditions and anyone suffering from COVID-19. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Lungs function well. Be healed in the name of Jesus. I speak to all sickness in the name of Jesus and I command it to go. Bodies be healed. All pain, I command you to go now in the name of Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. Father, will you pour out your healing oil upon each and every person who needs it? In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Oh man, thank you so much, Marie. We're we're really praying this morning to encounter God personally uh, in our homes, uh, the God of love and power. And one of the ways that God has given us to encounter Him is this amazing, simple uh, symbol of bread and wine. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Pete, who's going to lead us now. So Pete, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do communion and. Uh, and share bread and wine shortly so if you haven't uh, grabbed those things then you've got a couple of minutes just now um, we've been looking at the story of exodus and just as in exodus 2 and um, moses is welcomed into the house of uh, ruel and uh, he's given some food um, he's welcomed in from the desert where there is death and he comes into uh, a welcoming house and he's given some food and he ends up marrying um zipporah the, the the guy's daughter and 
And that is a lifelong thing where people stay together through better and through worse. Uh, and in the same way, we are welcomed in as Christians from the desert of sin and death into the king's banquet, into the table of the Lord. And so we share in the bread, we share in the wine um, together as one body, as one body, as one church, one collection of churches and as a global worldwide church. We rejoice in this. We enjoy this. This is a wonderful, glorious thing because because of Christ's suffering, we are free. And so we share in two reminders of his suffering, the bread for his body and the wine for his blood. And also somehow gloriously, we get to share actually in his suffering. So the tough times we go through should cause us ultimately to rejoice. What a strange thing. What, a, what, a, what an odd thing. Peter writes this in, in the book of 1 Peter. Um, this is verses four through seven. He says, um, uh, we are given a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So we have this incredible inheritance coming up. Um, and in this, this is verse six, we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found in result of praise and glory and honour the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have got so much to rejoice about. And as we just contemplate what Jesus did for us um, on the cross when he died, um, and then two days was later raised, um, we rejoice in his suffering, even though we also take part in his suffering. So that's what we're going to do um, this morning. So I'm just going to read from Luke 22 as we break bread and then... Um, and then take wine. So it says in, in Luke 22, and he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, Lord, just as we take uh take some bread now, Lord. God, we thank you for the suffering you went through. We thank you that you took the punishment that is on our backs, Lord. The punishment should belong to us, but you took that punishment. And God, we just thank you that even though we have all sinned and fallen short, God, we do not have to pay for that, that you took all the weight of sin and death on your back. And we give you glory and we give you thanks for that. And likewise, the cup. After they'd eaten, he said, this is the cup that is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. So, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you poured out your blood for us. And it's in by that blood we have an inheritance that is imperishable and fading, kept in heaven for us. But we have that to look forward to. And now we get to just live our lives rejoicing, even though we are grieved by various trials. We rejoice in who you are and what you've done and the fact that we get to be your people. We get to sit at your table. And if all else falls away, Lord, this will remain your word, your body broken and your blood poured out. We thank you, Lord. Amen. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to John. Thank you uh, so much to uh, everyone who's taken part thus far. Thank you for your different contributions. Please, would you turn uh, to um, Exodus chapter 3, if you've got a, a Bible there with you. And uh, we've been looking at the, um, the story of Moses. And remember, Moses is the guy who is a, a baby drawn forth from the waters of the Nile by the Pharaoh's daughter and then uh, around age 40 the story we looked at last week 
or the little collection of anecdotes we saw last week, he ends up going from being a prince raised in the house of Pharaoh, the court, to becoming a, a runaway exile out in the, the wilderness in the area where the tribes of Midian were based. What, a, what a, an unexpected turn of events for him. Uh, if, it is worth, you know, we kind of like dash through and we're preaching through these passages. I've got so much I want to say, but it is really worth reflecting on Moses' experience. 40 years in the court aware that he's part of the Hebrew race, it would seem, uh, and yet living with such pleasure, such comfort, all the privilege of, uh, of of that experience, and yet maybe frustrated, you know. And then he takes the law into his own hands, so as to speak, and in a matter of a day or two, he's become a fugitive. What a, an unexpected change. What an unprecedented thing to happen to a pre, uh, a prince and then the story kind of goes very quiet 40 more years elapse 40 more years i mean these are long periods of time 40 years and you know nothing much happens and then he suddenly finds himself in exile his dreams shattered 40 more years of just quietness in the desert. What, what must that have felt like to him? I wonder, I wonder what he'd settled into. You know, the relative simplicity of being a shepherd, looking after some sheep. A lot less complicated than the court politics, no doubt. It's just worth reflecting on that and reflecting on God's dealings with a, a man like Moses or a man or a woman like any of us. Uh, it, 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 extraordinary, really, those periods of time. So this is Moses, now 80 years old or thereabouts, and uh, he's about to have an extraordinary encounter with God. The God who's been silent, as it were, for these first two chapters of Exodus. Suddenly there is about to be an explosion of revelation of this God. Lord, as we come to look at your word now, I pray that the power of it and the power of your holy spirit would cause us to encounter you encounter us lord in the in the word of god by the spirit of god lord let something flaming and fiery take place within these lounges and living rooms and different places in our homes where we are this morning or if we're watching it later god let there be encounter with the living god the god who is everywhere the God who, who changes that which is ordinary and makes it extraordinary, that which is every day and makes it holy by your presence. Let your presence come, Lord. Let your presence come. God, I've got some things to say, but I, Lord, I, I really want your presence to come. That's what we need, Lord. Not just a few words from me, but an encounter with the living God. That's what I pray for, Lord, for each one of us. I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord, our Saviour, the one who gave his life for us, who shed his blood for us, the one we've been celebrating in, in bread and wine. We ask it in his name. Amen. So let's, let's read. Uh, we're going to read the first uh, 22. Well, no, we're going to read the chapter, 22 verses. Here we go. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. That's, remember this chap we met last week who had given hospitality to him, also known as Reuel. So... Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your, off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. 
Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go a three day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favour in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbour and any woman who lives in her house, for silver and gold, jewellery and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Wow, what an amazing story. What an amazing encounter. There's so much we could say, but I will try and be disciplined uh, with the time. So God, uh, the first thing I want to say is this, that God is person. So in the story, Moses is, uh, in, encounters God, a God who manifests himself visibly in a fiery bush. Mysteriously, it says it's the angel of the Lord, and that's not explained to us. Miraculously, the fire does not consume the bush. This is what we mean perhaps by the word transcendent. It's beyond our comprehension. This is how God manifests and reveals himself but also audibly, visibly, personally, privately. It says the Lord saw Moses, just as it had said in the end of the last chapter, that God saw what was happening to Israel. There's a, a repeat of that. The Lord calls to Moses by name, person to person, just as God sees Israel and is going to call to them. Friends, this is the way that God deals with us. He sees us and he calls us personally. Even this morning, God sees you where you are. He knows you and he's calling you. Now, God's presence in this <clears throat> scrappy bit of uh, wilderness causes what would otherwise be just a totally ordinary place to become holy it's not a holy place by virtue of the fact there's something weird and spooky about it the only reason this place becomes holy is because God 
is there. Where God is, is holy. And the holiness is dangerous. Well, it's dangerous to us because in and of ourselves, we are not holy. The danger means that God immediately tells Moses he's got to adapt. He's got to respond to the danger. He's got to do exactly what God says or he won't come through this. Specifically, he's instructed to start by taking those shoes off. By the way, this is a repeat of what happens in Joshua 5, 13 and 15. There's a sort of a real similarity in those two stories. I don't know what this conjures up in your mind. It's not really explained to us. But culturally, at least, taking shoes off is a sign of respect before entering someone's home. Uh, You take shoes off when you come into a place of intimacy. You take them off when you come into a place of relationship. And although it's not a main theme within the uh, Old Testament... There is a no, rec- uh, no uh, explanation in any of the very detailed instructions of what the priests must wear about what they would wear on their feet. And there's an assumption from that silence that the feet, the feet of the priests had to be barefoot in the temple because of that. Being afraid of God's presence would be the wisest response. Remember, Moses is the guy, he's, he's killed someone. He's fled. But the incredible message of Christianity is this, that God has done everything that is required to make us holy. Now, you you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm aware of all my shortcomings, my failures, my bad attitudes, the things I should have done, that I haven't done, the things I have done that I just so regret. But where God's presence is, he makes that place holy. And God sent Jesus to die for us on the cross so that we could be forgiven for our sin and when we by faith accept and receive that gift the Bible tells us that we are made holy we're God's holy people the Bible word that is saints we're made holy and God by his presence now dwells not near not just near us but literally within us. The the metaphor is used that we are described as being temples of the Holy Spirit. God has made us holy so that his presence can indwell us. Just as the wilderness of Horeb was made holy because God's presence was there, if you have faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, if you know him, God is in the business of making you holy. So Moses has this powerful encounter with God. And I'm utterly persuaded that God is in the same business of powerful encounter today. I wonder, have you had such an encounter with him? Maybe that's what he wants to do with you today, literally where you are in your home. So who is this God who's revealing himself to Moses in the story? Well, God reveals himself as I am. Always present. Self-sufficient without any need or want or lack. A God who is flaming. There's a, like an output, an overflow, a, a radiance, an iridescence that comes out of him. He's like a torch. He's like a lighthouse. He's like a some kind of beacon of, of light and fire. He's a flaming fire that is never exhausted. He needs no fuel. The overflow of his glory is brighter than the brightest sun in all the galaxies. And of course, for Moses, the power of this bright fire attracts his attention. This is what God does. He attracts our attention. Maybe through crisis, maybe through catastrophe, maybe through beauty, maybe through creation. God stops us in our tracks and grabs our attention. But words are required for Moses to know this God. It's not enough just to have your attention grabbed, you need to know God must explain to Moses who he is. Now, God has been revealing himself in history. God has been revealing himself through actions. But God has also been revealing himself with authoritative words which explain and define who he is. That's recorded for us in scripture so that we can be sure about who this God is. The very story we're reading today helps us to know who this God is. So what does Moses do? 
he asks God effectively, who are you? You're asking me to represent you, but who are you? What's your name? I don't know you. I don't know enough about you. Well, in the scriptures, frequently names carry deep and rich meanings, insights into a person. We, we give names often because they sound nice. But God uses names to convey prophetic significance to people. And God's name, or in fact, God reveals himself with multiple names in the scriptures to help us to know the truth about who he is. Names reveal essence. Moses is the drawn out one. That's what his name means. And as we know the names of God, we get to know more and more about who God truly is. Of course, we might fall short of our identity. God never does. Now, my understanding of Moses' question is that although he was, had an awareness of his ethnic identity, he was distant from relationship with God, as were his people. There's no sign of worship, of intimacy, of God, God nearness with his people. It seems that they drifted far from him. Now, in Moses' day, at this stage of his life, God is about to bring a revival, if you like, to these people and restore them to a knowledge of God such as Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had known. These fathers had known God for themselves. It's the same God that they had known intimately but these people had to be reintroduced to this God. We need God to reveal himself to us. The dungeon flamed with light, wrote Wesley. God deals with us and he speaks with authority in his word. Do you know God personally? Or could it be today that God wants to reveal himself to you? God goes on, he says, his name is I am who I am. Yahweh. It implies uncreated self-existence. Who made God? No one. God wasn't made. God has always existed. He's author, sustainer of creation, He's the sustainer of all existence. All existence comes from him because he is existence. He's unchangeable. He's eternally reliable. And yet he's always personally present with his people to ensure that his plans and purposes always are fulfilled, always according to his promise. The name implies that he is personally knowable. The mysteriousness of his name implies hidden depths for us to explore and yet the fullness of that beyond our fathoming. We can know God truly, we can't know him fully. It seems that the, the knowledge of God but according to this name only really becomes widespread amongst the people of Israel from this time onwards. God now is going to reveal some more of himself more perhaps than the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had known. They'd known God truly, but there was something more coming. And through the Old Testament, there is a progression of revelation, never contradicting what's gone before, but more and more and more. The people are getting to know God better, you might say, or it's recorded for us that we might know God well. Of course, the New Testament tells us Hebrews chapter 1 that in all of these revelations, they were partial, they were limited, they were a little bit more shadowy, the final, the fullest, the greatest, the brightest, the hottest revelation of all revelations, a, a burning bush, no, a burning man of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate revelation of who God is. We can't know God fully, but we can know God truly. And in Christ, we know him in the fullest way possible in this age. He's the one we need to get to know. So through this story, we're getting to know God better. He's the God of their fathers. But on this Father's Day, it's worth reminding us that our status and standing with God can't rely upon your father's relationship with God. Maybe you look at your dad and you think, wow, he was such a godly man. It'll be different from different ones of us, of course. But maybe you think, wow, or my parents got such a great relationship with God. But Moses needed to know God for himself. You can't rely on the previous generation's knowledge of God. Or maybe you, you, you're kind of thinking, well, in previous generations, you know, the, those that went ahead of us, you know, what, haven't they done a great job for us? We need to know God in our day. 
We need to know God for ourselves. He wants to have uh, present day dealings with each one of us. So Matthew 22, verse 32, we won't turn to it, but Jesus in conversation with uh, the people of his day tells them that through this, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are alive. And so buried within I am who I am, the God of the fathers is an implicit promise of resurrection, eternal life. Death was not the end for Abraham, Isaac or Jacob, nor is it for us. Who is this God? He's the God of the Hebrew slaves. Now, what God, who has got a bit of a reputation to keep up, would say, I specialise in a slave people. Can you imagine the humiliation? The Egyptians' panoply of gods all identified themselves with great skills, great wonders, great things. Yahweh says, I'm the God of slaves. What a lowly position. How humiliating, how humble. What a God who wishes to be associated with the weak and the despised. Reminds me of someone I know who is called friend of sinners. What an example for us as his people in terms of who we befriend, who we relate to. Paul says not many of you were this, that and the other. Not necessarily great or famous or wise, powerful in the world's ways. But God is the God of those who are humble. Now, as the account of uh, Moses meeting God continues, we see a really important principle, which I just want to highlight, which is that God's purposes are guaranteed by God's promises. Remember at the end of the last chapter, God said that he'd seen, he'd heard, he knows. Now it's repeated to Moses. He's heard, he's seen, he knows. And God always reveals himself to us in what we might call covenant. What do I mean by that? Covenant is about a solemn keeping of promise. It was there at the end of chapter 2, verse 24. God deals with human beings according to his promises. We call that covenant. God always relates to us on the basis of promise. The reason God is having dealings with Moses is because he made promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and his promise was to deal with their sons and he's doing that now in dealing with Moses. He's the promise keeping God. He always keeps the promises and the promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob applies to Moses. It's the grounds of confidence in dealing with God. Israel might have lost, might have lost connection with God. I think they had but by covenant they are still what God would call my people. He's come down, he says, to deliver them out of Egypt and into the promised land, Canaan. Even though at the moment it's occupied by others, God's promised something. God's purpose is that the, his people will be his people and that they will be in a place with him forever. That's his promise. That's his purpose. He does it by covenant. God will always keep his promises. And so... In order to accomplish his purpose, according to his promise, Moses is receiving a commission in his day. It's deliberate. It's intensely personal. It comes out of a private encounter with God, although it's going to be very public what he has to do. Verse 11, Moses is sort of going, whoa, hold your horses, man. I mean, me? I don't think I'm suited to that. Isn't that interesting? This is the Moses of... Well, 40 years earlier, who takes the law into his own hand, sets himself up as, up as judge and protector and saviour. Now God begin. Now God's saying, it's like, this is your time, Moses. And he's saying, mm, not so sure. Interesting what God has done in his heart over these last 40 years. This is a changed man. Moses becomes known for his meekness. I think we know why he had become meek. So God's response to Moses saying, I don't think I can do this is to give him two promises in verse 12. The first promise is this, I'll be with you. It's the same promise that Jesus gives his church at the end of Matthew's gospel. It's a promise repeated over and over and over and over in scripture. God will be with us always to the end of the ages. Personally present. Personally present with us. By the power of the Holy Spirit with every one of us. Jesus 
explain that so carefully to us. We looked at it some weeks ago in John's Gospel. That's the first promise. God will be with you. Second promise to Moses. You are going to come back to this mountain quite soon with the nation and you're going to serve me. In other words, you're going to do an act of worship before me. And when that day happens, you will know that I've kept my promise. He said, this is definitely what's going to happen. On that day, you'll know that the promise has been kept and fulfilled. Two promises. Now two tasks for Moses. One, in verses 16 and 17, gather with and report to the elders. Second task, go to the king, the pharaoh, the leader of Egypt. And tell him that he's got to release them in order that they might come here and do this act of worship and service that God has predicted, promised will happen. Israel, remember, we looked at this a week or two ago. Their calling is to be a nation of priests, worshippers, the servants of God. Moses is. That's the identity of God's people. It's our identity too. This explains why Horeb is called the mountain of God. It's going to be the place where Israel is going to come and worship God. It's going to become the place where they met God. It becomes holy because God meets them there by his presence. And God is going to define them as a nation shortly by giving them the law there. Nothing special about the mountain, that is, until God turns up. Think of the encounter Moses has, fiery, mysterious, yet audible. This is a foreshadowing of Israel's experience that's coming very soon. But there's a problem. God tells Moses the problem. He's been given this incredible commission and then God says, oh, by the way, Moses, uh, sorry, the Pharaoh's not going to let you go. Verse 19. What? But you just promised me all this stuff, God. You just said what's going to happen. And now you're saying that Pharaoh are just going to block this completely. It's going to be impossible. It's going to be like the iron chariots that were faced in later generations, undefeatable weapons. What are the obstacles before you that are impossible things for you to overcome? For Moses and his generation, it's going to be Pharaoh. But then God goes on to say, he's going to have to be compelled. God's purpose can only be accomplished by God's power. And as a result of that, judgment is going to fall on Egypt, verse 20. Moses is being asked to do what is humanly impossible. However, it has a divine promise, a divine guarantee that it's going to happen. In a sense, it takes all the pressure off. If Moses encounters obstacles and difficulties, well, of course. If Pharaoh says no, well, of course. And what can Moses do about it? Absolutely nothing. And yet, will that stop God? (laughs) No. God's unstoppable. And we know how the story ends, though Moses didn't. But this was the promise, the covenant promise that God had given. Amazing. And then just to sort of, I mean, you've got to see the funny side of this. Not only is Pharaoh going to make it impossible for you to go, God says, but you're going to go because of my hand. Then the the last section is, oh, by the way, I want you to go next door just before you leave. Send the ladies round and then ask the next door neighbours who are Egyptians to give you all their gold, silver, all their treasure. (laughs) What? I mean, if you went next door now and said, "Uh, give me all your money, please, and all your jewellery, well, I mean, what response would you meet? How ridiculous. How impossible. The Pharaoh's going to say no. The Egyptians aren't going to want to lose you. You're their slaves. You're doing all this work for them. And God, it, it's like, it reminds me of the story up on Mount Carmel. Do you remember where the sacrifice, before it caught fire, it was covered in, in water just to make it impossible for something just to be burnt. And God sent such a fire from heaven that the water-soaked sacrifice was completely consumed and the stones too. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Impossible, inconceivable, implausible and promised by God. And if it happens, then it will only be because God has done it. Whatever we're called to, friends, it can only come about because God has done it. And God has promised that this is what he's going to do. Indeed, the promise of God in Genesis 15 and verses 13 and 14 is being kind of like brought into uh, into life in this fresh uh, commissioning that's given to Moses. 
and the plunder that the Israelites are going to collect is going to get converted into worship utensils for use for the worship of God in the tabernacle. We'll maybe get to that one day. We've got a personal God who reveals himself in actions and in words. The story, I think, reveals to us that we've got a generation who knew a bit about God, perhaps, but they didn't know him personally for themselves. No close personal relationship. What about us? Do we know God personally for ourselves? Are you aware of his power in your life, leading you, directing you? Do you have promises from God? The Lord Jesus came so that we might have all of those benefits. The Holy Spirit has been sent so that we might live in that fiery reality and presence. God's the covenant promise keeper. He keeps the promises of scripture in order to fulfill his good will and purpose. And he speaks today. I want to pray for us now. I want to pray first of all for anyone who perhaps feels that they don't know God personally for themselves. This is an opportunity for you to have that encounter with God right now. Oh Lord. Thank you for your amazing, powerful presence, Lord. Locked doors don't stop you. You can meet us in wilderness. You can meet us in the wilderness of our sin. You can meet us in our shame and sorrow. You can meet us in our days of great triumph. You can meet us anywhere. I'm asking, Lord, that there would be an encounter with you in homes right now. Lord, I pray for anybody who does not know you personally for themselves. That right now there will be a a strange warming in their heart. And that they will want to say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe in you. I want to know you, Lord. And I want to pray across the, the kind of the gathered screens, as it were, in the gathered houses. I want to pray now for a fresh commissioning from God to come to us. We might feel like, how can I share my faith? I'm stuck inside. How can I share my faith? No one wants to listen. These things seem impossible, but the promise of God is that as we, the Holy Spirit comes on us, we will be his witnesses everywhere that he takes us. So I'm praying, Lord Jesus, right now for the fiery presence of the Holy Spirit to come, not to damage us. Just like that bush was not consumed, it was able to be a testimony to your power. Lord, may we be like that burning bush today. Lord, let there be many burning bushes across Deerham and maybe even across the nations listening and receiving this right now. Lord, fill us with your power. May we host the fiery presence of God. May we shine brightly and be the light of the world. May we be a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. May our words, may our works, and even the wonders that we do in your name, Lord Jesus, speak clearly about who you are. And I pray, Lord, even now you'll whisper into hearts and minds commissionings from heaven. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to draw things to a close there. Our time has uh, has really gone. It's been, uh, again, so good for us to be able to uh, be together this morning. I trust that the Lord has met you. I'm just going to, for a few moments, put back up onto the screen uh, the rolling PowerPoint, which will you'll see as it rolls round, it will contain the, uh, the, the contact details. And I'd just like to invite you, if you uh, aren't already kind of connected to with us just to reach out through one of those means and just let let us know and maybe ask us to pray with you or speak with you a bit more we'd love to love to get to know you a bit more so i'm just going to say a a kind of a farewell and god god bless you all and i'm going to get the uh the the powerpoint up now have a really really great week thank you bye-bye